Welcome in to Indisputable. It is Adrian Lawrence. I'm filling in for Dr. Ritchie, and we are having some technical difficulties, but that's all right. We're going to bring it, and we're going to bring it the best we can. And fortunately, I am joined by Rebel HQ contributor and analyst, Jessica Burbank. That's right. You're going to know her, and you definitely know her name. Let's go ahead and dive into our first story, which I'm sure if you're on social media right now, you know it is trending. It's about Senator Lindsey Graham. Yeah, he's taking time out of his subpoena dodging uh, efforts to go ahead and introduce federal legislation banning abortion after 15 weeks. Check this out. Here's what I think. I think we should have a law at the federal level that would say after 15 weeks, no abortion on demand except in cases of rape, incest, to save the life of the mother. And that should be where America's at. And what would that mean if we adopted that position? If we adopted my bill, our bill, we would be in the mainstream of most everybody else in the world. The abortion issue in America uh, has always been part of our political discourse. It will continue to be. And this is my position at the federal level that we should reject the most radical bill I've ever seen introduced by Senator Schumer and his colleagues that will allow abortion up to the moment of birth. That is extreme in every fashion. And we should be talking about legislation for the nation as a whole that would put us in line with the science in the civilized world. So I look forward to the debate. I look forward to the vote. If we take back the House and the Senate, I can assure you we'll have a vote on our bill. If the Democrats are in charge, I don't know if we'll ever have a vote on our bill. Yeah, Graham may look forward to what the debate, the vote. I look forward to him being less of a hypocrite uh, because his proposed legislation, really, it's coming just weeks after he what, went on CNN and said that abortion should not be handled at the federal level. Check this out from August 7th. The point I'm trying to make is I've been consistent. I think states should decide the issue of marriage and states should decide the issue of abortion. Yep, yep, that's Lindsey Graham and exactly what we'd expect because when... Uh, what, the Supreme Court reversed Dobbs? Graham was also very much celebrating the thought that states would be able to decide abortion rights. But instead, now he's joined by the anti-abortion leaders introducing this bill called Protecting Pain-Capable Unborn Children from Late-Term Abortions Act. Yeah, again, Graham previously introduced bills that sought to ban abortions nationally from 20 weeks versus this new bill calling for a ban after 15 weeks. This is just hypocrisy at its finest as far as I'm concerned. It also seems to be a far cry from a actual late term abortion because that term itself is not being used here appropriately. This is not about facts or science. Check out this post from Washington Post, Caroline Kitchener. It's stressed here in what she tweeted. Little more context here. Late term abortion is not a medical term, but a political one deployed almost exclusively by the anti-abortion camp to the extent that it's used. It's generally understood to refer to abortions after 24 weeks or so. Yes, because we know pregnancies are about 40 weeks. So planning this abortion, banning it at such a short amount of time, it's not late term at all. And the timing here we also know is quite interesting in terms of Graham passing this uh, bill off to be voted upon. We know this from Axios. Graham's plan comes less than two months out from the midterm elections with abortion expected to be an important issue for voters following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Republican candidates across the U.S. have moved to disappear. Hardline anti-abortion stances they took during their primaries, particularly in battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Colorado, Arizona, and North Carolina. So pretty much Graham thinks that this move will make the GOP appear more moderate. More from Axios. Graham's bill is designed to present Republicans as being more mainstream on abortion by pushing a partial ban over either a full ban or what they characterize as Democrats and abortion on demand position. But the reality is that there's so much danger from this position, from this purported ban. Rights groups have warned a nationwide abortion ban would have disastrous health impacts. One recent an analysis by experts at the University of Colorado Boulder estimated that prohibiting abortion outright at the federal level 
would increase the United States already high maternal mortality rate by 24 percent. That's absolutely ridiculous. Being a black woman and knowing that our maternal mortality rate is higher than all other groups of women, I know that this means that black pregnant women would potentially die. This is very, 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 very disastrous. And it's also not aligned with any kind of science or facts, but it's very much aligned with GOP's efforts to maybe take the midterms. What do you think, Jessica? I think Lindsey Graham saying, I'm being consistent here, I've been consistent here, is hilarious. He's been consistently hypocritical, wavering on his views based on what is politically convenient by his calculations. Let's talk about freedom, which is something the conservatives love to discuss. All right, let's talk about the freedom for our, us to make choices about our bodies because people matter more than states. But let's also remember the states' rights argument. They framed this as if we had national rights guaranteed in this country, that that would mean there was authoritarianism and the federal government can't have too much power. So by some convoluted argument, pushing this back to the states would give people more freedom. He's just lying and spinning and relying on a short-term memory of the American people. Many people won't remember that video from August 7th, and they'll only see this new clip of him discussing this bill he's proposing. But people don't really care that much if they're hypocrites, and even if we point this out sometimes, it's not exciting for people to watch how the media and our politicians lie so frequently. They know that they're hypocrites. What's more important is to talk about what would happen if this ban went into effect. In Louisiana, there's a woman, Nancy Davis, who is pregnant and who is considering either carrying a baby to term that is missing half of its skull or traveling to Florida to try and have an abortion before she hits the 15 week mark. These are the kinds of decisions people will face if the abortion ban is in effect. This is a decision that should be between a person and their doctor, not one that is made up by Lindsey Graham. There is an Alabama jail that's detaining pregnant women and new mothers for alleged drug use while pregnant, albeit none of them have been convicted whatsoever. This per the root. Under Alabama's chemical endangerment law, which was interpreted in 2013 to protect fetuses, women who test positive for drugs while pregnant in Etowah County can be held until they attend a drug rehab facility and pay the county $10,000 in cash bail. Now, the individuals who are involved here, Emma Roth, here she is. Uh, she's a staff attorney for the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. She's also representing the women here. And she says it's not really that simple in terms of drug use, and thus you are in a position where you are going to be detained. No, not at all. Also per the root, the combination of lack of space at these rehab facilities, lack of cash to pay $10,000 up front, and in some cases not qualifying for inpatient rehab, has left these pregnant women stuck in jail for months. That's right, they are in jail for months. And the thing is, again, it's not that clear and easy when it comes to determining who has been using drugs or even why they should continue to be detained and jailed. For example, Ashley Banks, 23 years old, she was detained after admitting that she smoked pot the day she found out she was pregnant. Here's a picture of Ashley Banks. And because Banks didn't qualify for drug rehab, she spent the next three months of her pregnancy in jail. Meanwhile, due to overcrowding, Banks slept on the floor throughout a high-risk pregnancy where she bled for five weeks and suffered from hunger and fainting spells. And then there was a woman named Holly Burns, mother of two, arrested six days after her son's birth. She tested positive for meth and Subutex, which is used to treat pregnant women with opioid addictions. She's challenging the validity of her drug test right now as her lawyers say that it was a false positive due to nasal medication that Burns was taking. She's also been denied access to pads and new underwear despite bleeding for days after giving birth. She's been separated from her children and newborns for months and yet, the DA, which is Carol Griffith, she's standing by the county's decision to keep Burns detained because of her failed drug tests. This is this is absolutely upsetting and disturbing. It's re it's real here that the United States is simply looking to punish pregnant women. Yet at the same time, they want so many of us women to continue to give birth, to populate. Yet at the same time, we're punished for it. And I get that there is drugs potentially in this situation, but at the same time, if you have a pregnant woman and you're supposed to be protecting the fetus, why is she sleeping on a cold floor?
why isn't she in a safe environment that would protect her fetus and keep her from having a high risk pregnancy? It doesn't make sense at all. But then again, very few aspects of our legislation when it concerns women's bodies actually make sense. Jessica. Do women have a, a shot at carrying a pregnancy to term and having a healthy pregnancy under these conditions? No, but the same politicians that are advocating for banning abortion are going to be silenced on this like they usually are when we talk about the disgusting nature of our criminal justice system in the United States. This policy clearly oppresses working class people, everyday people in this country who don't have a lot of money. Think about the decision they are facing. Uh, by the way, let's also mention Ashley Banks, 23 years old, smoked pot earlier on the day she was found she found out she was pregnant. Is that a crime? Is that a reason for someone to be in jail? She didn't even know she was pregnant or risking the life of a fetus. And who knows if she'll make the choice to carry that pregnancy to term. But if you test positive for drugs, you can either go to rehab, go to jail, or pay $10,000. Many people do not have access to health care in the United States, and many people have health care plans that will not pay for them to go to rehab. So your choice is to cough up $10,000, which I'm sure most Americans absolutely do not have in their bank to pay. And, and so you're left with this option of now you're in jail because you smoked weed earlier on the day you found out you were pregnant. This is the same kind of criminal justice and disproportionate uh, policing of black and brown communities, of working class communities, putting people in jail for marijuana charges, but now making it even more severe that if you're pregnant and they drug test you and found out that you smoked weed earlier on the day you were pregnant, they're going to put you in jail. And it's the crime is being poor here when we look at it. The crime is not smoking marijuana here. Yeah, I would actually say the crime is also being a woman. Uh, it, it also really kind of sits with me, this thought that you're smoking marijuana, how that's supposed to be dangerous to the fetus, where I don't necessarily know that there's research out there because the last I checked, um, our federal government was saying there's not enough research on marijuana, uh, despite us having had the substance forever. Uh, but if you are a woman who drinks alcohol or wine, you're not finding yourself in any in any handcuffs, yet we do know that alcohol is a toxin, yet it's readily available. You know, it just really shows you the hypocrisy of our nation when it comes to drugs versus alcohol and this carceral state that we have operating. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next story, which comes to us in Ohio and is a follow-up to what, just about two weeks ago? Yeah, because it was less than two weeks after the fatal shooting of 20-year-old Donovan Lewis uh, that the Columbia, Ohio police chief has issued a policy change. That's right. So for warrants that are served late at night, things will not be done the same way in which they were when they took the life of 20-year-old Donovan Lewis. But before we dive in, here's a reminder of what that horrible shooting was. And I have to alert you that the following footage is quite graphic. We're gonna send that dog in. That's where three D ninety one I have fifty. Hands, hands. Oh, oh. He got something in his hand. Got something in his hand. Hands, hands, hands. Hands, hands, hands. Hands. Let me see your right hand. Crawl out here. Crawl out. Crawl out. Right. Hands behind your back. Call for a 24. Hands. 43 10, start at 24. Mm -hmm. Get your hand behind. Stop resisting. He's pulling away. 104, yes. we're on the three. Stomach. Okay. You want to go near that? Yep. Yes, that was the video in which uh, Mr. Lewis's life was taken while they were executing that warrant. Now, on Thursday, Chief Elaine Bryant directed the Columbus Division of Police to seek high level approval now for some warrants that are served between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Now, Bryant's memo, it read this in part. Effective immediately and until revised or rescinded by me, no pre-planned arrest warrants shall be served at private residence 
for all misdemeanor offenses, including domestic violence and nonviolent felony offenses between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. without the prior approval of a lieutenant or above. Pre-planned means the sole reason you have decided to go to the address is to serve an arrest warrant. This policy does not apply to tactical units, for example, SWAT, INTAC, and task force personnel. Now, Lewis, uh, who had been shot uh, about 2.30 a.m. on August 30th when police executed a felony arrest warrant for alleged improper handling of a firearm, domestic violence, and assault. Well, one of the officers executing that warrant, that was Officer Ricky Anderson, had fired his gun when Lewis appeared to raise his hand. Chief Ryan said a device appearing to be a vape pen was later found on the bed right next to him. There was no weapon ever found. Now, Anderson, that's a 30-year veteran of the force uh, assigned to the canine unit, he was placed on paid leave, which is protocol for officers who fire their weapons on duty as the investigation is ongoing into whether he engaged in any wrongdoing. Now, Columbus police have had a number of high-profile fatal police shootings for the past two years. December 2020, Columbus officer Adam Coy, it's on the right, was fired after fatally shooting unarmed Andre Hill, who was holding a cell phone. Uh, now, the city reached a $10 million settlement with Hill's family over that deadly shooting in May of 2021. But just the month before that, Columbus officer Nicholas Reardon killed 16-year-old Makai Bryant. You may remember that. Now, although he was later cleared of any wrongdoing, it left a stain and sting when it came to the city. And so in September of 2021, the Department of Justice opened a review of Columbus PD policing practices. And that was done at the request of the mayor and the city attorney. I'm really glad to know that officials have engaged in some kind of review to ensure that the Columbus PD is not violating civil rights of its citizens. At the same time, this situation with Lewis and executing this warrant it does give me pause. It gives me considerable pause. I do very much appreciate that the chief of police is now instituting these practices. I just don't necessarily know uh, how much things are gonna change because people sleep at all different hours of the day. They're not necessarily uh, involved and active to be able to go to the door, hands up. And so there's just a lot of concerns over this continuous ed um, execution of these warrants. Uh, Jessica. Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like good news initially, right? It's a, a good step, it sounds like, to get rid of these no-knock warrants. But now I think we're just going to see the police pushing for higher charges so that they can keep doing these no-knock warrants. I don't have a lot of faith in criminal justice reforms, especially incremental ones that are being announced by police chiefs. What happened to Donovan Lewis was insane. It's all on video. It's all in the police body worn camera footage. He was shot within moments of the officer opening the door. And this argument that he was reaching for something, possibly a weapon, we now know there was a vape pen nearby. I didn't see him reach for anything. He fired so fast. I am not convinced he believed his life was under threat at all. And that's why it's insane that this officer is on paid leave. He's still being paid. He should be suspended without pay. This investigation should not take more than a few days when it's all on video. It's very clear what happened there and why I think they take so long for these investigations when the actions are clearly there on video for everybody to see is because they wait for media coverage to die down a little bit so that when they finally announce their decision in the case, they're not met with backlash from the public. And the last time I was on Indisputable with Dr. Ritchie, we talked about how people are up in arms with the conversation around defunding the police when the police are defunding themselves. They're paying out $10 million settlements for wrongfully executing citizens. They are defunding themselves. That's a lot of public taxpayer dollars. And so if you care about where your tax dollars go to, these are local tax dollars that you pay into a pool of money. If you don't want these going to lawsuits where they have to settle with families where citizens are killed by the police, maybe you too have a stake in, in, in criminal justice reform in this country. Yeah, I really think uh, we the people should see it that way. I think that a lot of people, um, what they end up seeing is that this money ends up coming from the pool of resources that is taxpayer funds, and then you see departments and people in leadership end up taking money from, whether it's education, transportation, roads, to fill the coffers of policing units, of law enforcement. And so without the consequences, it seems like nothing will change. No matter who is paying, it's just nothing is going to change until law enforcement actually faces actual consequences. But we'll see if that comes to pass. As Dr. Ritchie says, stick and stay.
Welcome back to Indisputable. It's Adrian Lawrence filling in for Dr. Ritchie. And there is some exciting news coming as it concerns Nina Turner. Yes, unbossed with Nina Turner. Only weeks away until the start. And Nina was, she's going to expose how the elites in government, media, and other sectors game the system and what you can do to fix the corruption. Subscribe to Unbossed with Nina Turner and get ready to tune in daily at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific, starting on October 17th. That's going to youtube.com slash unbossed TYT. And let's go ahead and listen to what y'all got to say. Excited to hear from you. So as far as Lindsey Graham introducing that national late-term abortion ban, well, Mickey C. the Silver-Haired Dragon says yet another Republican was no idea what was in row. Hate-mongering by lying that abortions are freely done up until birth when even Roe banned them after six months. Lie, lie, lie. Yes, and as far as Soul Life says, I like how Roe was federal overreach, but a ban isn't. Yeah, exactly. The hypocrisy is surreal. Aaron Okanos says, Graham is more or less saying, vote Republican so your rights can be taken away from you. Mm. Fiddle and Nero, Graham flip-flops more than a fish out of water. Absolutely. And as far as the jails uh, in Alabama, essentially detaining pregnant women to protect their fetuses. Well, Forbeszilla says, what about people who take prescription drugs? Because those are drugs. That's right. And also not available says not only punish, but also push them into poverty. Yeah, exactly. $10,000 for rehab. Occam's Taser one says, it is in the kids' best interest that they rob the mother blind, obviously. Exactly. Also, for Ohio's police doing that policy change after the Donovan Lewis shooting, well, Starbright0415 says he can't even move and all they care about is cuffing him. Yeah, that's it. Moon Dragon, dead man resisting arrest. That's tenacity, exactly. We fully rolled our eyes when he said that. Pitchforks Dragon says our justice system is trash. Throw it away and start over. And also, Conrad Williams, warrants must be signed by a judge who all too often rubber stamp them. I wonder sometimes whether they even read them. Don't let these judges off the hook. That's right. As far as YouTube members, Moon Dragon has been a member for four months. Thanks for joining us. As Adrian Lawrence and Jessica Burbank, Power Team. All right. Rx Ooze has been a member for two months. Says, it's my C day, Virgo gang. Yeah, I can appreciate that. I can also appreciate a Karen or two. So here you go. Wish Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're still French! Back off! I've had a couple of African-American men threatening my life. Okay. Put your feet in. Ma'am, put your feet in so we can close the doors. Okay. You're going to close the door. You stay right there. Before we move. Hey, 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 calm down. hey, calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Back up. Back up. Back up. Hold on. Hey, get a good. Get your foot back get in your there. Foot back in there. Get your foot yourself. back in there. Ma'am. Ma'am, we're going to have to tase you. You're not going to like that. I don't understand what you're telling me. Put your feet back in there. Bro. We're gonna have to uh secure in a different in a different vehicle. Come on. Absolutely ridiculous. Are you out of your mind? That woman, she was perfectly fine trying to push some early uh, kind of I, I, I can't think for myself. I have no idea. I was possessed. Get out of here with that. You know, it's just some people really act a fool and they're willing to showcase it at any given time. Jessica. I love seeing, you know, the aftermath of when a Karen acts up. We usually don't see this part where there's actually consequences and there's something happening with law enforcement. Just insane. She immediately, maybe, I don't know if I'm giving her too much credit here, but perhaps thought, oh, I can go for an insanity plea here. So let me just start acting crazy. Whenever I see these Karen videos, it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing to see 
you know, there's so many different ways, you know, Karens exhibit casual racism. You know, you could see your, your friends, like I was talking to my friends about this this week. If you have white friends and you bring them around black friends, seeing them act differently, uh, that's the most basic form of racism we see. It's the really casual type. Then there's, you know, the overt racism. Then you have the Karens who are out in public who are intentionally trying to cause problems, usually with working class people of color, trying to evoke a reaction. And I really think it's because for these, you know, Karens, it's their self-perceived like value and society comes from their place of privilege and nothing else. And so they spend their time making problems and exerting that privilege. I think about, you know, Christian Cooper, the bird watcher, where the Karen harassed him and tried to evoke a reaction from him. It's also embarrassing to see videos where you've got a bunch of white people standing around doing nothing at all. Like allyship means action. If you see someone acting up, trying to cause problems, and of course the Karen's gonna be the first one to threaten to call the cops, but intervene, say something, say what you're doing is not okay. Usually there's a crowd of people around and it's just wild to see the aftermath of a Karen interaction ending in, I'm going to go with being possessed by a demon. Maybe she was. Uh, maybe she was. Well, uh, you know, I, I think it's better than the excuse of Ambien, or at least it's far more entertaining. Uh, but it just, it always kind of gets me too, because I, I don't know, it makes me think a little bit deeper about the potential of an insanity plea if you are possessed or if you uh, proclaim to be possessed. Um, I don't really think it works for her, uh, assuming she was actually prosecuted uh, for whatever offenses that she was arrested for, but mm -hmm. it is quite uh, entertaining to watch. So uh, the best wishes to her and whatever demon possessed her. Let's go ahead and turn to a new report that is trending right now on Twitter uh, about slavery. Yeah, it's not so much a thing of the past at all, but a very real part of modern day. That's according to a recent report released by the United Nations. An estimated 50 million people worldwide are living as modern day slaves. Now this marks an increase of nearly 9 million people enslaved since 2016. Here's a chart there that illustrates the rise. Because according to the UN, they define modern slavery as forced labor or forced marriage. And it's far more common than you think. Modern slavery consists of 27.6 million people, including 3.3 million children, enduring forced labor and 22 million people in forced marriage. The report found that more than half of all forced labor occurred in upper middle income or high income countries. Migrants were three times more likely to be involved in forced labor than adult non-migrant workers. Four out of five people in forced commercial sexual exploitation were women and girls. That's right, they saying countries in which uh, there is a high amount of income, like the United States, are where it's more likely to occur. So let's not think this isn't going on in our own backyard. And as far as the background on these forced marriages, Axios says this, more than two thirds of people forced to marry against their will were women and girls, and the vast majority of forced marriages were arranged by family members. 26% of forced marriages occurred in high or upper middle income countries, while roughly 60% of people forced into marriage lived in lower middle income countries. Again, this is stuff going on in our own backyard. Now, why has there been such an increase since 2016? Well, here are some of the possible contributing factors. Overlapping crises from the COVID-19 pandemic to climate change to armed conflicts have caused unpre unprecedented disruption to employment and education and increased extreme poverty, unsafe migration, and gender-based violence, leading to a heightened risk of modern slavery, according to the report. Now, the UN also says that uh, in order to fix this or even address it, we really need governments to step up. Uh, also, we need trade unions, employer organizations, and just all around protection of civil rights. And as far as I'm concerned, also, um, you know, making education mandatory when it comes to women, girls having access to it. Uh, because oftentimes we'll see when it comes to child marriages, at least, that the first thing is, is that they're taken out of school. These things are happening and they're happening all around us and they're not okay. Jessica. Let's not forget that slavery is, is legal in the United States. The 13th Amendment clearly states that slavery is illegal except as punishment for a crime. And we have a huge for-profit prison system in the United States. But I do really like the definition given by the United Nations and the International Labor Organization here, uh, calling it forced labor. 
Uh, and given the number of 27.6 million people, by their definition, I'm not sure actually how they've worked out these numbers. Because when I think about forced labor and the quotes that you've shared there, I think, okay, in the United States, you've got to go to work and sell your labor to someone else who's going to give you a wage that is oftentimes far less than what you would need to cover housing, to cover food costs, health care costs, provide for your family even. And so you've got to work for much longer hours than many people deem reasonable. Where do you draw the line there for what is slavery and what is not? If your choice is to work for 70 hours per week or not have a home, not have food, not have health care, that's forced labor as far as I'm concerned. That is a version of slavery. So I'm a little bit perplexed as to why the number's so low if this is their definition of slavery. But I totally agree with their proposed solutions, more unionization, because we know that our elected officials in this country are not going to do anything about this. They've had plenty of opportunities to make legislation, to regulate corporations, to increase public services given to our social safety nets. Instead, they're funding the military industrial complex and giving a ton of federal money, public money, to defense contractors. Those, those dollars should be going to programs so that people can survive. They can continue to have housing, they can continue to have food, they can have health care. Instead, what we've got is people being forced to do labor to survive. And we're seeing huge profit margins, especially during the pandemic, where people are capitalizing on those of us who are stuck at home. Many people started ordering things online. We saw Amazon start making record profits while people were dying in warehouses. The people working in those warehouses are living under slave-like conditions. And let's not forget the racial dynamics within the warehouses. You've got bosses who are majority white looking over workers who are majority black. And so when we talk about slavery being forced labor, I like their definition, but I would argue the number is likely higher. No, I think the number would definitely be higher if it were more accurate of a reading. But I also think that the UN is plugged in just like a lot of other uh, global entities that they don't necessarily want to call out uh, the wealthy to the extent that they can avoid doing it. Because mm -hmm. uh, just as you uh, so aptly explained, it would be so many more people if they truly were to decide that slavery and the definition of it uh, was so much broader, but they can't afford to do that. So they're going to limit it in that regard because it makes it all more palatable. Yeah, Ugh. such a good point. I would you know, point to also the amount of money the United States spends on defense and being such a huge military power that gives them outsized influence on what's going on in the international arena and definitely outsized influence over the work of the United Nations. As much as they want to fight for human rights and be impartial as an organization, when the United States is the most powerful actor in the United Nations, they can't really do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. But we know uh, it's all capitalism. <laughs> and keeping it happy. But yes, we want to keep you happy. And so we have more stories for you. So as Dr. Itchy says, stick and stay. It's Adrian Lawrence. Welcome back to Indisputable. I am filling in for Dr. Ritchie. And I have high aspirations, not only for you, but for aspiration. Yeah, that's right. That's the app that keeps track of your spending. So you can use the app to see your progress all in one place. Go to aspiration.com slash DYT to open an account and decrease your carbon footprint. Also, head over to the watch list. That's right. Join J.R. Jackson live weekdays, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can watch live daily and subscribe at youtube.com slash watch list TYT. Let's jump over into Georgia, where a high school principal was caught on video saying the N-word. That's right, it was during a discussion with students about race, because why not drop a racial epithet in a discussion about race? Well, a student happened to capture the incident on their cell phone. Check this out. He's at the desk and say, yo, pimp, yo, what's up? What is, they're gonna report that to their human resources division. So, what, are, what am I calling you that is so bad? Mm -hmm. There's slang for white, and it's the antonym to which is a very offensive comment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like almost saying that to a white person. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want kids using the term here. Pimp, I don't want wait, anyone pimp and dog. Right. All right. All right. So first of all, I heard I heard a hard ER. I'm just trying to say that. That's all I heard. And apparently we heard it from East Forces uh, Principal Jeff Cheney. 
That's here is his picture here. Well, he was the official who was recorded on that September 9th day by that student. And the school acknowledged that the recording does feature Cheney's voice. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad they didn't try to pass this off. A school spokesperson issued a statement about the incident saying this. Cheney immediately recognized his mistakes in comparing the two words and using the full N-word. Mr. Cheney contacted the district office and met with the parents of the student to disclose this information, apologize, and commit to rectifying these mistakes in the future. He is not at school today. That's very interesting. I sure do wonder if he decided to contact the parents before or after he learned that he had been recorded. Well, the spokesperson would go on to say, that officials said students and adults both make mistakes and they believe everyone can learn from the incident, noted the report. It's unclear if Cheney faces any sort of disciplinary action. The student's identity has not been released, nor should it be released, as far as I am concerned, because uh, this young man, as I assume it was a young man, uh, is definitely out here doing the Lord's work in terms of capturing what these administrators are all about. And this happens to not be the only issue in that school district, yeah. There are other school officials who've gotten in trouble for using racist language uh, that's made headlines. In May, a substitute teacher in Arlington, Texas, uh, shouted the N-word at sixth graders while arguing over whether it was offensive to use the phrase, oh my God. And in August, in Taylorsville, Utah, a vice principal was transferred to a different school after using the N-word to demean an eighth grade black girl. And no, that wasn't the same school district, my apologies, but it seems like it's something going on in these school systems. Uh, but I also would definitely say that it seems that these administrators and those in charge don't recognize the significance of the term, especially when it leaves their mouths, particularly when they are not uh, black. Yeah, because it often seems to be uh, the situation. And the fact that the principal even equated um, with the N-word, that's kind of not on the same level. You know, as we'd like to say, you know, if you have to maybe censor one of the words, it's probably worse than the other word. But also I would like to say that the power structure and structural racism, institutional racism, and all the other forms of racism where white supremacy reigns in our nation would make it so that any kind of slur toward white people is not exactly on the same level. But that's just me, Jessica. Yep, I'm on the same page. These two words are not the same and we're in a weird space where members on the right and white supremacists and racists are trying to compare reactions to racism uh, to racism itself. The reactions people have to systemic oppression and racism will never be as severe as the racism itself. It is a reaction. They, they are not equal. One, you know, a reaction can never be worse than the initial onset. And we're seeing a lot of this right now with how people are talking about the Queen of England's passing. And it's ridiculous to assume that people owe colonizers, people owe oppressors, people owe racists some degree of politeness and decency. We're expected to just take it. And in response, just respect their authority, respect their prestige. Absolutely not. When there has been centuries of slavery, racism and colonization and imperialism in this world, people are waking up to the fact that why would we ever owe these people any respect or decency? But this story is about the kids. So let's let's focus on the kids. Kids are not inherently racist. I don't think anyone's born on this world as a human being with any sense of racism. Racism is taught, and racism is frequently taught in the schools. Racism is rampant in the schools, and the response to that is an accurate teaching about race and history. And they frame critical race theory as a dangerous theory, as a racist theory. No, it is a reaction to the growth of racism in this country. And to teach accurate history about what has happened is necessary to dismantle systems of oppression. And that is precisely why people are fighting critical race theory being taught in schools. Instead, if racism is the problem and you claim to be against it and you're outraged that CRT might for some reason escalate racism, which is a ridiculous argument, Maybe you should care equally about condemning racism in the schools, especially when it's administrators perpetuating it. Absolutely. Yep. 
And it would be great if these teachers had the knowledge themselves to understand that those two terms are not on the same level. But as you've noted, this whole um, deception when it concerns teaching our history and the state in which our country is in and how we got here, it really seems to be in full force, not only at the educational level when it comes to students, but very much at our governmental level in the efforts to silence people. But uh, we are going to silence ourselves and go to break. So as Dr. Ritchie says, stick and stay. Welcome back to Indisputable. It is Adrian Lawrence filling in for Dr. Ritchie. And if you don't know, it is day two. Yeah, that's right. Day two of Shop TYT Member Appreciation Week. Yes, members can celebrate the day two of our Appreciation Week by enjoying special access. That's right. Access to the new release at tyt.com slash notice. Yeah, that's right. We launched all new 20th anniversary, a hat that you will definitely want to get your hands on. So definitely check that out. As far as the 913 primary, which is today, well, we're covering it in Delaware, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. It's all going down tonight. Tune in, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. You got Jank, John, Emma breaking down the races and results in Delaware, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. That's right. Watch on tyt.com slash live. Also, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. All right, let's get into what y'all got to say. As far as that Atlanta principal, essentially cut in using the N word with a student. It's just Vegas says someone in Georgia saying the N word, never. Mm -hmm. uh, Neon Death 07 says, I almost choked on my lunch, what an idiot. Metal Kitty, Com Kitty Mom says, I wouldn't call casually throwing out racial slurs a mistake. Racism is just racism for real. C. Michael Henson with the $2, thank you for that contribution, says principal was teaching critical racist theory. I like that one. Rose Rosie says, the principal says this word a lot. It flowed out too easy. You're right, it did. And to be honest, I'm pretty confident that the student is a white male. And he just thought, the principal thought, oh, we can just talk to each other like this. That, that's how I feel it went down. Jennifer Torella says, I'd say fire the principal, but he'd probably just get hired in some other school. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That and, as we know, white men can make as many mistakes as they want, uh, including this particular teacher, another teacher. That's right. There was a group of middle school boys that thought that their male teacher was acting creepy toward girls at school. So what did they do? They started tracking his behavior. Yeah. Eight seventh grade boys from Davisville Middle School in Rhode Island created a pedo database that's been tracking one male teacher every sketchy move that he made toward the girls in his class since January. The database is now being used as evidence in an investigation against that male teacher. And that male teacher's name hasn't been released because he gets to be shielded publicly from accountability as far as I'm concerned. Well, the group of boys, they first noticed this uh, behavior that was inappropriate. Well, while well, they were in the sixth grade. OK, so this is what we know. According to The Globe, his actions included leering at some girls, singling them out with pet nicknames and encouraging them to dance for him while male students were treated with contempt and sometimes cruelty. They tried to tell students about what they were witnessing. They tried to tell, excuse me, adults about what they were witnessing, but were brushed off without much concern. Sometimes the girls would laugh. Sometimes they just kind of just sit there awkwardly. One of the boys told the Globe in an interview, even the ones that said he was creepy laughed because they were obviously not trying to tick him off or anything. So they're just fake laughing, awkwardly laughing. And as a woman, I can tell you, yeah, that's oftentimes what we do. Because what are you going to say to someone who is bigger than you, who's also in a position of authority over you, who is making you feel uncomfortable? The response is not necessarily one in which you would think would be um, maybe normal when it comes to feeling uncomfortable, but let me tell you, it's very normal. And the sound bites that the boys ended up documenting from the teacher, well, they range from deeply uncomfortable to downright gross. Uh, here's a few of them. You all love me, so choose love. You got to stand up and dance now. Everyone in bathing suits tomorrow. One student would remark, I felt bad for the girls because sometimes it just seems like it was a humiliating thing, the boy told the Globe. He'd play a song and he'd make one of them get up and dance. Now in April, this same male teacher was placed on leave for allegedly stalking a preteen girl at another school while he was her coach. Yeah. 
because this is a behavior. That's something that I often talk about when it comes to harassals in this world. This is how they act. It's never a one-off. And that investigation is ongoing. But what seems to be most concerning about this entire situation, as far as I'm concerned, is the overwhelming disbelief from those who the boys reported the situation to. Per the Globe's report, even after being reported for stalking, the teacher went on to coach in two other school districts, and even some parents had a hard time taking their son's allegations seriously. Yeah, that's right. They weren't unwilling to listen to these kids. These kids know better. They know right from wrong. They know when people are feeling humiliated and uncomfortable, and they use their voices to speak out only for the adults, individuals who are supposed to be protecting them, to dismiss them, to remain silent as opposed to taking them seriously. And just think about it. If the boys using their voices were dismissed and ignored, why didn't the girls speak up? Well, you have your answer right there. Yeah, and it also shouldn't be surprising about the situation with this male teacher allowing to continue to stay at the school and be able to move around and coach as he pleased, considering past scandals in the exact same school district. Now, North Kingston public school system, well, it found top administrators turned a blind eye to the inappropriate behavior of former high school boys basketball coach Aaron Thomas. Former student athletes had come forward to accuse Thomas of making them meet him behind closed doors and strip naked. Behavior they said he had engaged in for years. Once naked, the coach would instruct the teenagers to perform stretches, sit cross-legged in front of them and allow him to use a caliper to pinch and measure their body fat. How absolutely demeaning and disgusting is that? Yet this individual was able to do it for years and years. And to think that no adults knew, I don't believe it. I think that they turned a blind eye. And hey, that was found to be the case. Why don't we listen to our children when it comes to sexual violence, when it comes to this type of harassment behavior that goes on from those who they should be able to trust? It's a question I don't know the answer to other than the patriarchy, but I can damn sure tell you it's completely unacceptable. Jessica. Absolutely. I think you're right that the most outrageous part of this story is the disbelief, because you and I both know as women who have to interact with men in positions of power who use that power, everyone has a story who use that power in ways that make women terribly uncomfortable. And so the types of phrases that he uses, coming in bikinis, dance, it's the kind of casual, seemingly friendly, but entirely inappropriate and things that make women so uncomfortable. The last thing you want to do is go to school where you're intending to learn and get an education. And all you learn is that men will objectify you when they're in positions of power throughout your life. Children should not be subjected to this. The fact that he has done this before, has stalked a preteen girl, and he was the coach of the team, and he still has a job in the schools, is insane. And this story just goes to show how people in power will not be held accountable and how the powerless don't have justice in our society. Children in school are forced to be there for the entire day. The fact that these girls were just uncomfortably laughing, where are they going to go? Are they going to stand up to their teacher who has to give them a grade and might complain about their behavior to their parents? This is a bad situation. The fact that it was a public school is a huge problem as well, because these people are under the custody of, of the government, right? When you're in a public school, you're no longer under the supervision of your parents. You're at the mercy of those teachers. So the story is disgusting. But I like that the kids are all right. These boys that created the database to track the behavior were standing up to power. They were organizing together and they were being good allies. I'm sure they were upset by how this teacher was you know, treating them with contempt and giving the girls favorable treatment. But at the end of the day, what they did was stand up for those girls. And I also like, as someone who has used data before, um, and have a background in using data, data can be used for good. We always hear about, you know, the evil uses of data, you know, corporations selling your data for profit and giving you targeted advertisements and coercing you into buying things that you don't need. And also the more malicious examples of how the Trump campaign has used data online, collecting very personal information about people to find out who was susceptible to misinformation, then pushing misinformation to them during the Trump campaign in 2016 to push them in the direction of voting for him. But I really like the notion 
that data is like a knife. This is something that a whistleblower at Cambridge Analytica said. They said, you know, you can use a knife to make a sandwich, but you can also use a knife to really hurt and murder someone. And this is an example of how just collecting data in one place can help you build power and use it for good. So solidarity with these kids, this is an example of good allyship and the kind of behavior you can exhibit if you see wrongdoing. I know that things like this have been done on bathroom doors. I heard a story about Columbia University law students in the women's bathroom writing down the names and sharing stories of men who made them uncomfortable and who have a history of doing things like this. There's a lot of power in pooling information together to hold others accountable. I just wish that the teachers listened to them because even when they were well organized like this, the teachers were not. Yes, and there needs to be consequences for this. As we saw with Columbia recently, they dropped in the rankings from number two to number 18 in terms of educational institutions, in part because a professor lied, but really it should be when the students aren't safe there because of sexual misconduct uh, committed by those in positions of power. And as we saw the sexual misconduct, or at least read about it, as it concerns the school district, uh, the thing that also truly, truly bothers me is the protection of the man's name. I, I think that we can all attest to the fact that this individual did engage in this, uh, these activities and this behavior, given the documentation by these children. And so I have no doubt about that as far as I'm concerned, as though, even though the investigation needs to continue, but really shielding his name, he should have to answer. These children have been subjected to being in an environment that is incredibly toxic. I'm sure it has played a role on the these girls, their lives. As you said, they're learning that they are going to be objectified, that they're going to be sexualized, and that they're going to simply have to laugh and nod and continue to move forward in, in educational institutions and in school where they should be safe. And so the thought that this man, again, continues to uh, enjoy anonymity is extremely problematic for me. Uh, as well as knowing that the school district has a history of this. Uh, altogether, I really hope that there is some kind of class action against the school district, because as much as when it comes to policing and having lawsuits and big payouts, um, as much as it doesn't really prove to be um, significant in terms of change, uh, with school districts, oh, it does, very much so, because they will get rid of those administrators. So teachers will be up and out. Things will change significantly. And so I do hope that the parents stand up. And additionally, I hope that the parents look inward, that they look to themselves and why they were so okay with ignoring their children's pleas, ignoring the thought that they were not telling the truth or also why their daughters didn't feel comfortable coming to them to say, I feel uncomfortable, that this person is making me uncomfortable. These are all things that need to be explored if there's going to be any meaningful change, but these parents need to definitely hold themselves accountable. Any last words, Jessica? Yeah, children are really impressionable. And it's important you point out that the parents and the teachers not listening to them has an impact. The kind of thinking that this puts them in is, oh, if someone wrongs me, people in power will not do anything to stand up for me. And you learn this behavior of, I just kind of have to take this. It's a part of life in this world. We need to be teaching kids that this isn't okay. And listen to them when they bring this up, because the kind of people you raise are people who will accept the kind of world we live in. And I'm sure everyone wants to believe we can stand up to power and see a world where our values are actually lived out. We have to teach our kids that that is possible if we ever want that to be a reality. And it really starts in these small ways where you learn that you are powerless in your current position. We need to validate children when they call out injustice because I do believe that every human being has a sense of justice and they're born with it. And when they see behavior where people are treating those that are innocent and those who don't have power this way, they want to stand up for it. And by teaching them that nothing really will happen when you do that is going to lead us into the kind of world where people are complacent, they don't want to engage in politics, they don't want to face the problems of our society or own them them as their own, they see themselves as a part of this system and they're going to make themselves comfortable and do the best that they can instead of living a world in a world where we all come together and actually stand up when we see things that don't reflect our values because everyone deserves to live in a society where their values are lived out and people aren't wronging each other every day. And by not listening to children who are coming to us from a position of powerless, we're teaching them that that's not possible from a very early age and the consequences are living in this kind of world for decades to come.
Yep, and that's not necessarily a world that I want to live in. So hopefully people will invest in making this meaningful change and holding the adults accountable who could have stopped this or who were engaging in the behavior uh, that was perpetuating this. All right, so as Dr. Ritchie says, stick and stay. We will see you shortly. Welcome back to Indisputable. It is Adrian Lawrence filling in for Dr. Ritchie. And let's go to what y'all got to say about that student or those students making the database of the creepy teacher. Well, Rajad Lad says the resourcefulness of children should never be underestimated. That's right. And Canadian, I believe Skin Dragon says, uh, these boys, or no, excuse me, this is Eatwood Max, says these boys are the standard all men should hold themselves to. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Creative Pixie says these are young men that will hopefully continue to be upstanding men and supportive of their partners by standing up for women now while they're young. Yes. Wildlife Art says we are taught early on to laugh off the uncomfortable pervs and the corrupt or we are considered nasty. Exactly. That's something that we women often face. Love Big 41 says so he has a consistent behavior and they still left him around kids. It says a lot about how people value and treat children. And Travel Nurse Dragon says, we wouldn't put up with parents acting this way, but we allow teachers to. Exactly. How many parents are out here empowering their children to push back and to speak up when a teacher is inappropriate? I can tell you mine did, and I think a lot more people out there need to teach their kids to draw lines because it's completely unacceptable. Because if they don't, we end up with adults who don't know how to act. And speaking of adults who don't know how to act, let's go to New York uh, former governor Andrew Cuomo. Because, you know, uh, apparently he is taking issue with the investigation that was done by New York Attorney General Letitia James. Yeah, her holding a household accountable is something that he did not like. And so he has filed a very lengthy complaint against James. Former Governor Andrew Cuomo filed that uh, multiple page state ethics complaint on Tuesday against the New York State Attorney General, accusing her of deliberately mishandling the investigation that found that he had sexually harassed multiple former and current government employees. Now this complaint in his is really a reflection of his latest effort to rehabilitate his image and really to lash back at his attackers after he resigned in disgrace amid multiple scandals and the threat of impeachment last year. Now, two weeks ago, Mr. Cuomo emailed a Daily News opinion article to his supporters that raised questions about some of the claims made against him and suggested that he may have been the victim of an excess of hashtag MeToo movement zeal. That's really cute, of course, because with these, it's a thought that it's everyone else and not them, I'm sure. Well, Cuomo's been truly investing in multiple efforts to restore his reputation. For example, he won a court battle uh, when a judge ruled that Mr. Cuomo would not have to turn over the proceeds of his $5.1 million book deal that a state ethics board was seeking to recoup. Uh, Mr. Cuomo spent millions of dollars earlier this year on television ads that sought to rehabilitate his image. He briefly reemerged from the political wilderness when he spoke at a handful of black churches stoking short-lived speculation that he would attempt to a political comeback this year, though he has since kept a relatively low profile. Yeah, that's always interesting too, um, trying to stoke the black community to come back when, as I can tell you, that 99% of the time where there's sexism, there's also racism. So uh, yeah, I think we could dig into that and see that this individual, Mr. Cuomo, uh, may also be leaning in that direction and that shouldn't be coming to the black community and the black community shouldn't be fooled by him. But let's go back to that ethics complaint that was just filed. It was 48 pages and it was filed on Tuesday today. It lays out many of the arguments and grievances that Mr. Cuomo has previously voiced about the investigation, including his contention that the final report was misleading and inaccurate, omitted evidence that favored him and was wielded for political purposes by Ms. James, who briefly ran for governor following Mr. Cuomo's uh, resignation. Well, the committee overseeing Cuomo's complaint, this is how it could play out. It could dismiss the complaint because of insufficient evidence, move to investigate the charges, or even initiate disciplinary proceedings. Disciplinary actions could range from a confidential or public letter of admonishment to censure, disbarment, or suspension from practicing law. 
You know, these uh, potential consequences for Letitia James, the attorney general, they are completely and totally, as far as I'm concerned, outrageous. And so this isn't something that necessarily should be uh, dove into. Uh, but Cuomo still has some powerful people in positions of power. So I'm sure in filing this ethics complaint, it is part of this rehabilitate his image, as well as potentially throw off the attorney general who's busy going after important people like Steve Bannon and Donald Trump and shouldn't be disturbed in this time. Uh, I really actually think it would be better for Cuomo to find employment elsewhere and realize that he is not necessarily cut out for leadership. Uh, perhaps he could spend his time working on not being a but that's just my opinion. What is your thought, Jessica? Attorney General James opened this investigation with plenty of evidence already public. Multiple women had already complained about what Cuomo had done. We now know the identity of one of these aides, Brittany Camiso, who just over a year ago came forth with this story where Cuomo allegedly groped her. We now know that it's very likely that he did. And the aide told him his behavior would get us in trouble. And then Cuomo said, I don't care, and shut the door and groped her breasts. And then a month later, she said that Cuomo asked her to cover up what she had done. I mean, there's so many stories and there's so much evidence. And to call this Me Too movement zeal, women don't gain anything but justice and a lot of threats when they come forth against powerful men with these allegations. And if there's one thing we can be certain, it's that he's guilty. Because I remember when these allegations hit the press, there was this photo that's been buried, but you can still find it, where it's Cuomo walking outside of the governor's mansion, broad daylight, wrapped in a blanket, in a suit, on the phone, holding a Bud Light Platinum. That photo in itself is enough to tell me that I'm sorry, Cuomo is guilty. An innocent man is not in broad daylight drinking Bud Platinum on the phone, looking concerned, wrapped in a blanket. I mean, come on, he could quietly retire. The fact that he is trying to fight this goes to show that he's delusional and all he cares about is his personal power. And instead, what's gonna happen now is gonna, we're gonna rehash all of the evidence again. And as far as I'm concerned as well, uh, you know, James would be a better fit for governor than Cuomo was. It was not a power grab to investigate these sexual harassment allegations. If anything, she said, you know what? I'm gonna have to do it myself. Uh, and more respect to her. The fact that he's trying to frame this as a political move is disgusting. Just to show he has no sense of justice. No, not at all. And, you know, just this audacity, it is surreal. This thought that he should be able to come back in office when he resigned, uh, you know, it's just, it's it's absolutely absurd, but it is nothing that I would say is uh, off the mark for because it's this thought of entitlement that it's okay if I acted this way. There is no problem with that. I am entitled to engage in this behavior. And this whole push to lie, lie, lie and cover what it is also hinging on is that the patriarchy is willing to go ahead and put on its Clydesdale blinders and just pretend that none of it happened and pretend that all of the witnesses didn't come forward. All of this pretending is just a way to bolster the patriarchy. And Cuomo knows it. He is hinging his, uh, he's hanging his hat on it and really hinging on this thought that people will allow him to come back into society and that there will be no issue, even though uh, what women who work with him are not safe around him. And as again, I will say, sexism, racism, they are ride or dies. So if you are a person of color out there, or I should just, I wanna say a non-white person out there, you should really think twice before backing Cuomo in any way, because I can assure you that what has yet to come out would probably come out given how it works when it comes to sexism and racism. But again, that's just me. And oh, that's just the end of our show. So I wanna really thank you for joining us, Jessica, with your insight. Can you tell the viewers where they can find more about you? You can find me on Rebel HQ. You can find Adrian Lawrence on there as well, but check out Rebel HQ on YouTube. Yes, that's right. And stick around here for Jordan Ewell with the deep dive. Thanks so much for joining us today and we will see you soon. A principal punches a special needs student, attacks a special needs student, gets reassigned as a principal to another institution. I'm going to bring you all of it, including the video, and we are going to handle this directly. All right, here's the video. Okay, there's a conversation it looks like, right? You have multiple adults in the room and you see the student there. 
the student is not attacking anybody. The student does not need to be detained. Then this happens. See that? None of the adults responded to the attacker. None. Now, let's put up the picture of the principal that did this insane and chaotic act. Keep that picture up. A video was released by the Fresno Unified School District showing a principal shoving a special needs student to the ground over the summer. This has led to the now resigned employee being charged with willful cruelty to a minor. That's one dynamic of the story, okay? So you're looking at former Walters Elementary School principal, Brian Bolhart, shoved a student during breakfast, according to the report. The reasoning behind attacking that student, which was an 11 year old special needs child is unknown. Nobody is willing to say, here's what it was. There cannot be any justification anyway. The superintendent, let's put his picture up. His name is Bob. Bob Nelson called the behavior repugnant. Nelson said Volhart's reported, Volhart reported the incident a day later and after the district started the discipline process, he resigned. So the principal resigned. He has since taken a job at Tranquility High School in the Garden Plains Unified School District, according to ABC 30. Volhart's name appears on the California Department of Education website as vice president of the school. That needs to change immediately. Immediately, that needs to change. Now, let's be 100 about everything here. What he did was criminal. He gets a charge, he resigns. But I gotta bring up this reality. Special needs student, 11 years of age, adults in that same facility, adults saw what he did and not one adult decided to detain the principal. Nobody, nobody responded to the principal. They all focused on the child as if the child had done something wrong. I got a lot more information. The California Commission of Teaching, Credentialing's website shows Ballhart, the supposed educator and school principal, has an active certificate and no adverse reports. He even has a specialized certi certification in handling students with autism. So here you go. You have a man with the academic credentialing, the prerequisite training necessary to be a more understanding and thorough educator and leader inside of the public school system. He has the background, has the experience, has the training, has the academy, but he doesn't have the heart doesn't have the soul. Nelson said the incident was reported to all relevant state agencies, but the, does not believe Bolhart's new employer called to check. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that you're hiring individuals to work with children? And as the hiring agency, you're not calling to check to make sure they're not, I don't know, criminals, child abusers, whatever. You're not calling to check. Well, that's according to one person, obviously, because if they would have called according to this individual, they would have known this is a no hire situation, but they did not. So this person got another job working in education. Let's put up the information of the school he's at now. Yesterday, 
Mr. Volhart was placed on administrative leave, but is still listed as the vice principal on California's Department of Education website. The school, Tranquility High School, phone number 559-698-7205. Email aparnell at gpusd.org. Courtesy of the California Department of uh, Education, all of this information is publicly available. Now, let me say this to the Department of Education. When I come back to work on Monday, he needs to be fired. That's it. This is a simple fix. You got to start caring about these students enough to at least do a simple background on the educators and the administrators you hire. This man committed child abuse, no question about it. And he was so comfortable doing it, there's no way I believe this was his first time. There's more. It was during the investigation, during the investigation into the June 7th physical abuse incident that Fresno Unified Administrators learned that Principal Volhart had a run in with the same child on May 27th. In that incident, the, the principal refused to let the child leave a classroom and ultimately forced him to the floor and put his knee on his back while holding down the student's shoulder for approximately two to four minutes. That is on the record. Let me also do this. The two staff members in the video and the child's guardians did report the June 7th incident and the police report was filed on June 9th, but system failures led to slow response from the police, according to them. The case was filed eventually, lingered for months, okay, at the Fresno Police Department until the victim's guardian complained two weeks ago about the lack of charges. Go to the police chief. This is the police chief, Paco Bell Dorama. In an email to the B, this police chief said he was not told about the June 7th report when it came to his department. Then it somehow got categorized as suspended. What? It got categorized as suspended. This particular case should never have been categorized as suspended and should have been assigned to a detective immediately. According to the chief, he said this in an email. So the principal was finally charged Wednesday with cruelty to a child by endangering health which is only a misdemeanor, but he got this good job over at the other school. He's working around students again. Corruption, abuse, cover up that goes all the way from that local school directly to the police department. This, ladies and gentlemen, has more than one criminal involved. This is a conspiracy. And I get what the police chief said, but chief, you're not going far enough. If you stand by your words and listen, dear brother, I have no reason yet to believe you won't. You got some crooked cops under your leadership. This is the opportunity for you to figure out who they are. Put some handcuffs on every single one of them. We're talking about a child, chief, a child. Two things. Primary on Monday. We want to report that this principal no longer has employment. And chief, I highly encourage you to do a full investigation because somebody at your department, if not multiple people in your department, engaged in a conspiracy to protect a child abuser. Dan, thoughts here? Yeah, let alone the systemic failures here from the police department who's protected this person who has routinely, multiple times now, we've seen abused a child with special needs. When children with special needs, honestly, when you have special needs in this country, because American society fails on so many different levels, when you go to school, that should be one of the safest places you attend or are able to have. So That's the right. fact that the principal, the top uh, person of authority at this school was acting with this level of violence and then was moved to another school called, you can't make this up, the, the principal who was found on video of punching a special needs kid was moved to a school called Tranquility. Yeah. All right. 
you don't want that headline. The school needs to change that so that's no longer a fact anymore, just like you said. But it shows these systemic failures of what's going on here. I don't even think that the fact that you could look up this principal in the California Teachers Board or whatever, and his status says that there's no incidents. I don't trust that status anymore because I don't trust what didn't make it to that record that mm. doesn't even involve this unfortunate incident right there. No, everything, every step of the way where this child and this family was failed needs to be looked at by an outside investigative authorities because this is sickening and disgusting. That's right. Well said. We're going to continue to follow the story, provide an update ASAP. All right.